I'll start the thank you. All right, everyone, welcome to day two, second uh, um, session. Um, I can't believe the, the conference is almost on the last day, um, but you know that means we are having a lot of fun. I'm glad to have you, uh, Dr. Jonathan Rafu Tracy. Um, my honor and privilege to introduce you. Um, Dr. Uh, Tracy is an assistant professor of uh, business at Worlds College, where she specializes in teaching mathematics, uh, sorry, management courses. Additionally, she also serves as an adjunct uh, faculty at Underwood University, where she imports her expertise in both management and marketing to graduate level students. Previously, she had been at uh, University of Technology in Sydney as an academic. Dr. Uh, Tracy's exceptional um, qualifications and achievements have garnered recognition throughout her career. She has received an outstanding teaching certificate from Kapala, not Kapala, Kappa, Delta, Phi, and has consistently achieved high ratings of uh, four to five um, in student evaluation. Her current research interests uh, evolve around leadership, specifically focusing on the dark side of leadership. Currently, um, she has three manuscripts under review by different academic journals. These manuscripts uh, explore important topics such as uh, neutralization techniques, moral disengagement mechanisms, and how leaders cope with guilt after impulsive, abusive behavior towards subordinates. Awesome topics, by the way. Um, Dr. Tracy's unique uh, perspectives as an educator is shaped by her extensive experience in the banking, and retail sectors with over six years of professional experience across three different countries, Bangladesh, the United States of America, and Australia. Uh, Dr. Tracy possesses an in-depth understanding of working with diverse individuals with various backgrounds. This exposure has instilled in her the values of respect and appreciation for diversity, which carries uh, into her research approaches as well. Uh, Dr. Tracy holds a PhD in leadership, leadership and policy from Niagara University, where she was awarded a full scholarship to pursue her doctoral studies. She also earned her uh, Master of Business Administration MBA degree with a major in strategic marketing management from Niagara University, graduating with a remarkable GPA of 3.85 out of 4 and being on the Dean's List. She further expanded her international academic experience by receiving full scholarships through the Endeavour Student Exchange Program at the University of South Australia. Uh, it's my honor and privilege again to um, uh, have you on board here. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Tracy. Please take it away. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. Well, thanks for joining me today. Um, let's begin. In your entire career, if you have ever experienced having a manager who put you down or who ridiculed you in public or criticized you verbally offensively in front of others or who just had a personality in front of who you really feared scared, scared or threatened, then there is a huge possibility you probably were a victim of abusive supervision at workplace. I'm Jonathan Rafia Tracy and today I will be exploring, today I will be talking about my current research and where I explored how leaders adopt different techniques of neutralization, meaning different rationalizations and justifications for their abusive behavior towards the subordinates. 10 to 16% of American workers experience abusive supervision on a regular basis. Now, this trend is, is growing and there has been a study where it has been found that almost 50% of employees in the US and across the world experience abusive supervision at some point in their career. Now, abusive supervision at workplace causes a lot of stress for the employees. To begin with, of course, employees suffer a lot mentally because the moment the employees feel that they are going to face a manager at the workplace who may not value them, who may not respect them and might ridicule them, might use different slang words to them, of course, they suffer a lot mentally. And when the employee suffers mentally, of course, the job performance of the employee tends to suffer to a very large extent. Therefore, the employee's performance and productivity tends to decline a lot. Many times due to abusive supervision, many employees try to 
get involved in destructive and counterproductive work behavior as well. They often start hiding required information, not only from their managers, but also from their co-workers who actually might be looking forward to them for some productive information. Now, this is very frustrating, of course, but many times due to abusive supervision, many employees' personal life gets impacted as well, because the moment the employee feels that they have to experience a very negative manager at the workplace, the frustration often that they experience at the workplace often gets spilled over in their personal life. And it has also been found many employees' personal life got really into trouble because of having negative manager. Their spouses, their children, their parents often were got, you know, got into trouble, became the victim of their frustration because the employee was having a very abusive manager at workplace. And of course, many employees who are more quiet in nature often go silent silent when they face abusive managers because they do not really know how to tackle or how to handle the problem, who they need to raise the voice to because they fear losing their job. Now, on the extreme side, abusive supervision has also been found to cause alcoholism in employees because everybody do not have this, the mindset to handle abusive supervision in a productive way. And many times people do not see any option but to rely on drugs and on alcohol to calm themselves down and of course to an extreme abusive supervision has also been found to be the cause for employee committing suicide at the workplace now these are all of course the list goes on there are many other negative impact that employees suffer due to abusive supervision and the list goes on but the ones we are talking about are basically the one that employees suffer organizations suffer too when managers are abusive at the workplace of course organizations suffer because healthcare cost rises when employees suffer because of an abusive manager what happens of course they have a higher need to visit psychiatrists to visit counselors and often they get different biological physical issues as well because of constant top being traumatized on a constant basis. Many employees get diabetes, many employees get strokes. So of course, overall companies end up spending way more money in healthcare expenses. In addition, companies nowadays spend a lot of money than they ever before did in training and in hiring the right perfect candidate for the job. Of course, the hiring and the training process requires a lot of time and effort. Now, all these goes into vain when the right candidate that the company just hired, spending so much money offering a lucrative salary, leaves the job because the employee started to experience abusive supervision at the workplace. So all those money spent in hiring and training also goes to waste. So of course, as we can understand at this point, abusive supervision does have detrimental consequences, not only for the employees, but also for the society, for the companies at large. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, what's the exact definition of abusive supervision? What are the behavior that are actually considered to be abusive at the workplace. Abusive supervision is defined as a defined as a subordinate's perception of the extent to which supervisors engage in the sustained display of hostile, verbal, and nonverbal behaviors, excluding physical contact. There are many different types of abusive behavior. For example, hiding required information, being verbally abusive using slang or curse word openly criticizing an employee, getting involved into questionable interaction, showing lack of respect, intimidating an, an employee, making hostile eye contact, demeaning, criticizing an employee publicly, favoring one employee over the other, threatening one about losing his or her job. And of course, the list goes on. Now, different authors used different terms to describe the above mentioned behaviors. Lipman used the term toxic to describe such leaders. Tipper used the term abusive to describe such leaders. Enerson described them as destructive. Keen described them as unethical. Kellerman described them as bad. But no matter what term each author used to describe this type of leaders, they all have agreed, they all came to the consensus that these traits are negative and they hurt employees to a very large extent. 
gap in the literature. Now, positive side of leaders are, positive leaders are extremely beneficial for the world. Leaders who are charismatic, leaders who are transformative, they bring inner potential from employees. Leaders who are positive bring the inner potential from the employees, they motivate employees to do their best. Now, just the way positive leaders do good to the employees, good are beneficial to the world, to the society, to the world, negative leaders are equally detrimental, not only for the society, but also for the employees, for the whole community. Now, positive side of leadership has gotten a lot of attention. And of course, they deserve the attention because positive leaders bring out in our potential from employees and they need it to be researched. However, dark side of leadership has been under-researched. It is only in the last two decades, dark side of leadership has gotten some attention. Now, and that's partly because of all the incidents, all the fraud cases we have been hearing about in the media in the last few decades, gave researchers the thought that maybe it is important to explore the dark side of leadership. It is important to understand why do some leaders do what they do? So considering the fact that majority of the study till now has focused on the positive side of leadership, there are few studies only the last two decades started focusing on the dark side. Now, among the handful of studies that did focus on dark side of leadership, mainly concentrated on the antecedent and on the consequences of dark side of leadership. Now, of course, understanding antecedents are important. For example, they found sleep deprivation makes managers abusive or individuals who come from abusive father often turn themselves to be abusive manager and they go to the workplace. Now, and they, of course, the consequences we just uh, saw in the previous slide, the consequences towards the employees, the consequences towards the company. So, of course, these are very important. However, if one wants to understand why do leaders do what they do? Even after understanding, even after knowing all the hardship employees go through because of having abusive managers, why do some abusive managers still continue to be abusive at the workplace? Now, in order to understand that, it is very important to understand the mindset of the leaders, which this study tried to understand. In addition, I would also like to point out that all past studies basically focused on corporate crimes, that crime relates to money. However, of course, those crimes are extremely important to be explored. It is also important to explore the crime a manager does by being abusive to employees. And the few handful of studies that did focus on the dark side of leadership, as I said, focused on the consequences, in order to understand the consequences, they always studied the abused employee, the victim. Now, of course, the victim can, of course, help you understand what the consequences the employee face because of having an abusive manager. However, if you want to study the mindset of leaders, it is extremely important to study the managers themselves who have been abusive with employees in the past. For this reason, as the purpose of this research is to understand that why do leaders do what they do? What rationalization, what justifications abusive managers have towards their, for their, abused, for their abusive act? This research studied self-identified abusive leaders to understand their justification and rationalization for their abusive behavior towards the employees. This study borrowed a very important theory, neutralization technique, from the literature of criminology. Skites and Mazda first brought this important theory, and they identified five important techniques of neutralization, meaning they identified five main rationalization and neutralization technique people usually adopt for after their abusive behavior or after their negative behavior. Why? Because as human, we intrinsically have a need to maintain our self-image of being a good person. No matter what we do, we all try to maintain 
our self-image of being a good person. We want to feel good about ourselves. Not only we do, not only that we want to maintain our good image in front of others, we also want to maintain a good impression about ourselves in our own eyes. So when we look at the mirror, we don't like to feel that, oh, I'm a bad person. We all have this inherent tendency to feel good about ourselves. Now, they found that whenever we feel that we might have done something negative, in order to reduce the guilt, in order to reduce self-blame, we often use different different mechanism to maintain our self-image of being a good person. So Skites and Matza identified five basic techniques of neutralization that people usually adopt when they get involved into any questionable behavior in order to maintain their self-image of being a good person and to reduce their guilt of, of doing that negative activity. The first neutralization technique that they identified was denial of responsibility. This is when the perpetrator blames the, for the transgressed act on another person or on the situation, meaning that a different situation is to be blamed or another person is to be blamed to bring out my negative behavior. Denial of injury is when the perpetrator believes that the transgression did no or minimal harm. Yes, probably abusive behavior has taken place. However, it did not really hurt anybody to a very large extent. The third neutralization technique that people usually adopt are denial of victim is when the perpetrator basically blames the victim to bring out negative behavior from him or her. Condemnation of the condemner happens when the perpetrator condemns those who condemn them to transfer the blame. Apple to higher loyalties is based basically when the perpetrator justifies his or her wrongdoing by saying that this abusive act was necessary for greater good. Okay, so in order to understand the rationalization technique leaders adopt, this study felt the need to conduct qualitative study. Now, there remains no doubt how important quantitative studies are especially in order to understand, to, in order to explore different variables, in order to understand causal relationship. They're extremely helpful. However, for topics like this topic, which is under research, as mentioned earlier, dark side of leadership is under research, only started getting attention a few years ago. So for topics which are, has been under research and for very complex, complicated scenarios, it is very important to understand, to conduct qualitative study with in-depth interviews. For example, this study where it is extremely important to understand the mindset of leaders. Why do they do what why what why do they do what they do? What goes in their mind? Even after realizing the trauma they cause to their employees, even after realizing the hardship employees go through because of their abusive behavior, why do some managers continue being an abusive? They continue to do what they do. So to understand that, it is extremely important that in-depth interview was conducted with those managers because this type of situation could not have been answered by quantitative study. Even the quantitative studies are really helpful to understand causal relationship for this study, interview was very important. And of course, in addition, when the research question has why and how component, it makes it even more important to have qualitative study, for which reason this study relied on in-depth interview. So how the data was collected? So of course, before even the study took place, it was realized by the researchers that collecting information regarding this topic is not gonna be probably an easy task because here in we needed individuals who would be willing to share their story of being an abusive manager in the past those who have realized what they have done in the past. So of course, identifying such individual was not easy. Therefore, it was found, it was realized that anonymous survey to recruit participants for the interview would be the best option because that will give in the in different respondents the option to decide if they want to come for an interview. So anonymous survey was first done. So this anonymous, after receiving the IRB approval, a survey link was posted in all social media accounts, in all social media sites. And, they, and of course, the survey link was also sent to all the email contacts of all the researchers in this study. 
Now, the sur survey was exposed to around 3,500 individuals. Now, anybody with an email account had the possibility could take the survey. However, in order to complete the survey, in order to take the survey, two criteria was important. One, survey takers needed to be 20 years of age at least, and they needed to have managed people for at least two years in the past. Now, the interview relied on self-reported data from the leaders, managers, and supervisors who have been abusive in the past, of course, because they are the best candidate to respond and talk about their toxic behavior as they are the first to be aware of it. Leaders and managers are considered to be the best to report how they treat their followers. So this study wanted to have individuals who have been abusive with their employees in the past. Now, the survey questions, how it was selected, who will be contacted for interview. Survey course, all the survey takers needed to complete this scale, abusive supervision scale of Dr. Tepper. A very prominent scale has been used in a lot of study, very helpful. So all the survey takers who responded for, meaning often or frequently got involved into all these 15 behavior, were contacted for interview as long as they have given consent to be contacted for interview. For example, those individuals who have said, I ridiculed the subordinate, either often or frequently. I told the subordinate that his or her thoughts or feelings were stupid. I gave silent treatment. I put a subordinate down in front of others. I invaded a subordinate's privacy. I blamed my subordinate to save myself from embarrassment. I broke promises. I expressed anger at a subordinate when I was mad for another reason. I was rude to a subordinate. I lied to a subordinate. So in all these categories, those who have only those who have rated themselves often or frequently, four or five, were contacted for interview. So total... 359 people took the survey. Out of 359 individuals who took the survey, 25 individuals gave consent to be contacted for interview. So total 25 interviews were conducted. Now out of 25 interviews, 21 interviews were selected. The other four interviews were not selected for the study because they did not add any valuable feedback. Now due to COVID-19, interviews were conducted via Zoom and over the phone. Now, there are two reasons why phone option was given, because considering the fact that this interview, this, of course, the topic is very sensitive, where individuals needed to talk about their own past negative behavior, there is a possibility people would get uncomfortable. So the option of phone interview and, of course, the option to have anonymity, of course, it was not an option. It, all the information was anonymous. It was expected that it will reduce, help such biases, and it will help reduce the impression management tendency of employees. Now, all survey take, all interviews, of course, did the survey. Interviews lasted for about 35 minutes, the longest being one hour, eight minutes, and the shortest one being 25 minutes. Now, questions were sent before the interview. The reason questions were sent two days before the interview is because this type of research needed people to recall an incident they have done in the past. Now, whenever a recall situation is involved, it is suggested, it is advisable that respondents are given the question beforehand so they have enough time to go through the event in their mind so that they get the chance to recall all the events. So during the interview, they have a fresh refresh of refresh of memory so they could sh they can share all the incident that has happened in the past so for that reason questions were sent to the interviewees two three days before the interview for this study semi it was semi structured and it was semi formal now even though all interviewees were asked the same exact question it was kept semi structured considering the fact that different uh, responses might need the researcher to ask question in that line of thought. So it was kept semi-structured and it was also kept semi-informal because of course the topic is very sensitive. It was It's expected that there is a possibility respondents might get very uncomfortable sharing their past negative behavior. So to ease the process to make respondents comfortable in the interview process, the interview was kept more uh, semi-informal, not very formal. And as I mentioned, anonymity and option for four interview was expected to reduce biases and the tendency for respondents to get involved into impression management techniques. 
saturation point was reached at 20. Okay, now let's look at the description of participants. This study tried to have respondents from diverse sources from many different walks of life. For this study, we had two Black American, 14 Caucasian, one Hispanic, four Asian. The, rep the sectors represented by the interviewees include food, retail, construction, financial, education, entertainment, medical. Countries of residence, 14 of the respondents were from USA, three from Bangladesh, one from Canada, three from Australia. Of course, gender, 20 was male, one was female. Education and sexuality was very diverse. Age range was very diverse as well. Findings and themes. This research found some very interesting findings. Of course, not something that was expected. So of course, I will go into detail at this point now. Just to sum up, the main thing was found that employees conduct basically brings out managers' negative behavior. Now, employees' conduct of many different types actually brought managers' negative action and reaction. Employees' conduct included being inefficient, being disobedient, be having inappropriate behavior, being overly em emotional, and having personality issues. However, it was also found it is not only the negative uh, behavior of employees that brings managers negative behavior. It was employees positive behavior as well, which brought out employees negative behavior. It is not on so because in general, we probably would have expected, yes, if the employee is disobedient, if the employee is uh, inefficient, it might bring managers negative behavior, but it was found. Even when the employee is very beneficial, very hardworking, very loyal, that also brought out managers negative behavior. Why? Because many times the managers claimed that they felt threatened. They felt insecure in form of that hardworking employee. So in order to kick that employee out of the company, many managers got involved into questionable interaction with those employees. So it is not only the employees Dis uh, disobedient behavior or, or inefficiency that brought out managers' negative behavior. It was also the hardworking and loyal employees who unconsciously bought negative uh, behavior from managers, as we can see from the quote here. There was a lot of insecurity brought about by the fact that I knew that this employee was putting much more effort into the job and exhorting much more effort into the job than I was ever willing to. I could do the job with my hands tied behind my back. As we can see from this quote here, that many employees suffered manager's abusive behavior, not only for being inefficient, disobedient, or for having personality issues, but also because of being hardworking or being too loyal to the company. Now, after the employee demonstrates the behavior, different types of behavior, whether being disobedient, whether being uh, too beneficial to the company, managers got involved into many different types of negative behavior, negative action. So we categorized all the managers into basically four types. So managers were found to be of four different categories. The first category of managers, we termed them as cursors. These were the type of managers who would use a lot of curse word. Every interaction, whenever the employee and the manager would have some trouble, the managers in this type of category would always use different curse word. This type of managers were found to be very common in construction sector. The second category of employees that we had was, the second category of managers that we had was hypocrite. We termed them hypocrite. These were the type of managers who would do everything that the cursors would do, uh, would get involved in the questionable behavior. However, they will never use any curse word. They will do a lot of negative behavior with the employees without using any curse word. Hypocrite types of managers were very common in retail and in banking. Backstabbers were the third category of managers we had, we identified in this study. Backstabbers were very different from curses and hypocrites in, in the regard they would never yell at an employee. They will never use any curse word. They will never do anything on the face. However, behind the employee's back, these were the type of managers who would do everything to ensure the employee do not get hired again, or they will do everything to ensure the employee gets fired from the job. 
for example, the one manager said, I didn't want to tell him that I didn't want to see your face anymore. He was not hired again. I made sure to tell my colleague from the department that how bad was the service he provided. Another person said, if you do not like someone in the work environment, we pressurize them. We make the environment hostile for that employee as we can't make them fire, we pressurize. So the person can leave the job by themselves. So these were the type of managers, they will never say anything on face to the employee. They will never curse, they will not yell, they will not do anything like that. But behind the back, they will do everything to ensure the person gets fired. These were found to be very common in many educational sector. Then the fourth type of category of managers that we identified, we found in the study were silencers. Silencers were the type of managers who would never yell, who would never do anything. Even when the employee made a mistake and needed to be corrected, they would not correct the employee. Even when they knew the employee needs feedback, needs to be mentored, they would not mentor, they will not give any feedback intentionally. Why? So that eventually their employees end up making so much mistake because of not getting any training, because of not getting any feedback, the employee ultimately gets fired. They probably they had a lot of blase attitude. So after, uh, okay, so as we can see, so employees conduct of different types brought out managers, different types of negative behavior, they would either get cursed or they will either get yelled or backstabbed or get silent treatment. Managers did experience a lot of emotions. Manage experienced a lot of emotions. And after get experiencing a lot of emotions, managers got involved into justifications, meaning different types of neutralization technique after experiencing the emotions. So what are some of the emotions they have been, we have found managers to experience? Managers experience a lot of guilt. Now, it may not be the type of guilt you are probably expecting. Yes, of course, that type of guilt was there. Guilt for being abusive to employees. As we can see from the quote here, I did experience guilt back then, and I do experience a lot more guilt now. Back then, there were shames. It didn't stop me from doing what I was doing, but I definitely knew that I was aware. I had an inkling that I was doing something wrong, and there was guilt about it because it was wrong. So, of course, managers experienced a lot of guilt. However, some managers experienced guilt in many different ways as well. Not guilty for being abusive to the employees, but managers have also been found to be guilty for tarnishing their own reputation by, backs, by backbiting about the employee in the department, as we can see from the quote here. It's awful to say, I don't feel guilty about his reputation being tarnished. But looking back, I didn't have appropriate behavior. It's a nasty way to say, perhaps, but I feel guilty because I tarnished all my image by saying nasty things about a third party, giggling. So it, guilt was experienced in different ways by managers. Now, after the manager experienced guilt, all managers got involved into different types of neutralization technique. What are the main techniques? Denial of victim. Denial of victim was found to be most used techniques of neutralization, meaning the rationalization technique adopted by leaders and managers. 19 out of 21 managers use this technique. Now, this is the type of technique when the manager believed that the employee deserved abusive behavior for his, her, or, or, for his or her action, meaning the employee brought it upon himself. As we can see from the quote here, my employee was watching cricket in his mobile and he was not attending the customers properly. His concentration was in the game. So I reacted very hard on him. I scolded him in front of my customers and everything. So here the manager basically blaming the employee for bringing out his negative behavior. The second most used technique of neutralization was denial of responsibility. 18 out of 21 managers used this technique. Here, the manager justified their abusive behavior by arguing that other personal and other official factors are responsible to bring out their negative behavior. Different managers mentioned different factors such as work pressure, having bad management, ha having nepotism at the workplace. Personal factors were being drunk being tired, or some managers even mentioned family upbringing to be the factor for their abusive behavior. 
For example, this person said, I was fairly new and getting sober. I already had maybe about four or five months since I stopped drinking and drugging. So this person was basically uh, was blaming the per this personal factor of, you know, recovering from drinking and drugging to be the to be to be blamed for his negative behavior towards the employee. The third technique of neutralization was denial of injury. 15 out of 21 managers used this technique. In this technique, the manager rationalized by saying that the employee was not hurt by his or her abusive behavior and action. And meaning that even though abusive behavior has taken place, nobody was hurt to a very large extent, as we can see from the quote here. I think that there may have been a temporary, very temporary financial crisis. He might have suffered financially, very temporarily. Emotionally, I don't believe so. Appeal to, loyalty, appeal to higher loyalties. 13 out of 21 managers use this technique. In this, the manager believed that this, beha this behavior was needed for greater good in order to teach a lesson to the manager, to the employee, or for to prevent something really bad from happening at the workplace. So this behavior was needed for greater good. As we can see from the quote here, I almost got injured of it. And it, I got very angry and handled the situation very poorly. Again, another person says he was carrying a large tray with a bunch of beverages, glasses, soda, and glasses of wine, and he dropped the tray, dropped the beverages all over brunch of, all over the guest at the table. I yelled at him and sent him home when he did that. So, of course, blaming, uh, explaining that this was needed, this behavior, uh, this uh, abusive behavior or this negative behavior was something that was needed to teach the employee lessons for greater good so that it doesn't happen again in future. Metaphor of ledger, 21, two out of 21 managers use this technique, not a lot. In here, the manager believed that as he is generally nice, helpful and beneficial to the employee, once in a while being abusive is okay. As we can see from the quote here, normally I'm a very polite with them, very friendly, but few days in a year, I do revoke. Condemnation of condemner was not found to be used by any managers. Now, from this study, of course, uh, there it sheds light on many different factors. It, it sheds light on the importance of receiving training on abusive behavior and how managers knowingly and unknowingly use different neutralization technique. As many people, individuals at the workplace often get involved into different abusive behavior and they often, in order to reduce their guilt, they often get involved into different neutralization technique knowingly and sometimes unknowingly. So what happens, it is very important, it shed light on the fact, on the importance to give training to all these employees at the workplace so they realize that many times we might be getting involved in the neutralization technique to reduce our guilt. Now, as it has been found from this study, denial of responsibility was very common and one of the most used technique of neutralization at, uh, of the most used technique by the managers. It is also important to realize that training should be focused on building leaders' accountability so that they fail to blame the situation or on another person. Because many times, leaders fail to take accountability for their action, as that it has been found from this research. Denial of victim was also very common among managers after their abusive behavior, and this also shed light on the fact in teaching managers that no matter what type of mistake the employee do or doesn't matter how inefficient they are, no manager actually has the right to feel that the employee deserves their abusive behavior. Now, many times uh, abusive behaviors are very common at the workplace, irrespective of location, race, ethnicity, as we saw, uh, we try to have a lot of diverse population in order to see if it's a global phenomena or if it's only common in a specific part of the world. And we did get a very good idea that actually it's very common irrespective of location, irrespective of gender, irrespective of you know ethnicity, it's actually a common thing, which shed light on the fact that Employees often leave. A lot of companies lose their valuable, hardworking employees for having abusive managers at the workplace. I was in the I was in the industry for about ten years, and I have experienced it uh, in front of me. I have seen a lot of 
my close colleagues who were very efficient at the workplace and they left the company only because they told they shared afterwards because they could not handle the abusive managers. So, of course, the company can save a lot of money in hiring and training employees as long as they identify abusive managers. Now, pre-screening can always be done. Pre-screening can be done during the hiring process to identify individuals who have a higher tendency for justification, who have a higher tendency for rationalization in different situations. In addition, strict policies should be built by organizations to tackle abusive supervision. Now, again, as I was in, this, in the industry of uh, in different co in corporate world for about 10 years, I did see that companies usually have a lot of different policies. They have dress code policies. They have policies how to handle customer complaint. But many times you don't really see companies having strict policies in regards to how to handle abusive supervision, partly maybe because many employees do not report them. Many employees are afraid to report this situation because they fear they will lose their job. They fear that nobody will trust them. And they fear that nobody will probably, they might become more victim of abusive supervision if they report. So for many different reasons, employees do not report, for which reason policies are often not built. So therefore, it is extremely important for companies to develop strict policies in regards to abusive supervision at the workplace. And it is also shed light on the urgency for ethics courses and training, not only for colleges and universities, but also for work in, for this type of training should also be offered in the workplace. Basic ethics and the ethics courses that can teach employees and managers how to be ethical at the workplace. Now, of course, uh, organizations also has a higher need to have an environment where abusive behavior should not be tolerated at any cost. Of course, I would like to mention some limitations of this study. One big limitations of this study is the fact that we had only one female respondent and 20 male respondents. However, diversity was achieved in other areas mainly in different sectors. We tried to have individuals from of different ethnicity and race. We tried to have respondents from different sectors, different countries. However, yes, uh, one limitation was we had only one female respondent. Due to COVID-19, this study, uh, we didn't have the option to have face-to-face -face interview. So we conducted Zoom and over the phone. However, there has been research that found that there is no huge difference in transcript between face-to-face -face interview and Zoom phone interview. In addition, we also felt that the option of phone interview was actually was helpful in this type of research because individuals were more comfortable with phone interview than probably they would have been with face-to-face -face, considering the fact that they had to share a negative behavior they have committed in the past. Interviews, there is a possibility that interviews might have gotten involved into impression management. As we all human, we are prone to impression management. We try to maintain our self-image in front of others and also to ourselves of being a good person. So there is a possibility of in respondents getting involved into impression management. However, this was handled by keeping interviews, everything anonymous, and it was believed that anonymity will reduce the chance for respondents to be involved in the impression management because they didn't have to fear, they didn't have to feel embarrassed that we will identify where they work or, you know, personal details. And another big limitation we felt could have been chances for recall bias. Now, this type of research needed respondents to remember a negative incident they might have done six months ago, six years ago, or 16 years ago. So of course, there was a possibility they might have got forgotten some elements of the incident, of the negative incident that happened. However, to tackle this recall bias problem, we sent the questionnaire to the respondents two days before the interview took place. And we hoped that they will have a chance to recall the incident in their mind and they will be able to recall the whole incident and they will be able to share valuable feedback with us during the interview. Thank you all. That's all from my presentation. Um, feel free to ask questions. And Dr. Tracy, this is uh, an excellent and timely topic um, to be discussed here. So it was uh, very nice that you were able to summarize your research here. 
um, I really appreciate this. Uh, let's you. have the questions here. There are already a few questions that are lining up. So I'm gonna ask those questions and I have my one questions as well later. So let's ask those questions. Um, one question is, what actions would you recommend for those individuals dealing with abusive managers? One action is, of course, uh, conversation. Because, of course, we interviewed all the managers who have been abusive in the past, and we did not interview the victim because our purpose was to understand the mindset of the leaders. But many managers did mention that if probably the employee came to us and had open conversation of what actually they're experiencing, maybe the problem would have been solved. Now, many times employees do not open up to managers who are abusive because of course they feared the person in the first place and they feared that how what's the point of going to this person and sharing that hey you are so abusive with me but they feared that how can this how can they approach managers like that however it has well it was found that many times managers actually expect because sometimes they unconsciously become abusive many managers do not realize that what the actions they are doing the things they are doing are actually abusive they don't realize it unconsciously they can get in they unconsciously they often get involved into neutralization technique and don't, they don't even see how abusive they are they feel it's a normal way of life so, of course, one way to tackle this problem by the employees would be to open up to the manager and, of course, for companies to offer training so managers get the chance to realize how they can be abusive unconsciously. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for answering that question. Yeah. Um, I have a few questions of my own, um, so if you don't mind. Um, sure. I'm going to more here. Um, I know you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the diversity component over here. Um, and as you probably are very well aware, uh, the cultural context plays a lot into how people um, perceive, uh, you know, these kind of challenges uh, to begin with. So, how much are the Hofstede's dimensions of cultural connections, like power distance, masculinity versus femininity, individualism? This is very interesting because uh, the, um, after I did this study, I'm the one currently I'm working on, I actually am bringing Hofstede's cultural because it's so much interesting, you know, the power distance and of course, individualism versus collectivism mindset. But luckily, I did have respondents from, of course, Asian countries. And I do see that power distance do play a very big mm -hmm. role. Now, many times those who were from the Asian countries often perceived their behavior not to be really abusive because they 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 felt that this type of behavior is needed to treat the employee to teach the employee some important lessons however it was found the ones from the west often considered did realize did have more guilt and they actually felt that what happened was not really uh, accepted so yes, but yes, I'm very excited because I'm working on this Hofstede on my current paper now where I will completely focus on this Hofstede cultural framework. And I'm very excited to see That's what research, I, what, what findings I find there. That's wonderful. So connecting exactly with that context over here. So the generational uh, perceptions, like how um, the millennial generation think versus, uh, you know, the Gen X uh, people used to think and stuff like that. Um, are, are those perceptions also getting factored into your surveys or, or did you already factor them? Yes. So I did have respondents of different diverse age group, but act there was no difference was found. Actually, all I the know. managers, uh, there was no no difference was found actually with the age group. All managers actually felt guilt after the abusive behavior, but some felt right after they did the abusive act, some felt several years after the incident has happened, but no such difference was found with the age group. They all seemed to have experienced guilt at some point. Oh well, yeah, good. You know, injustice and injustice, right? Regardless of the age groups. Good. All right. Okay. Um, one more question. Um, how to incorporate time elapsed between an incident? And I'm not sure whether you have already done that. So when somebody is having an abusive uh treatment, um, you know, I normally tell like I can't remember what happened. I ate for I ate for breakfast yesterday, let alone recall something that happened several, you know, days or weeks or months or years back. And um, so and these kind of things sit with your heart. And so I, I understand that. Um, but how do you recall uh, a potential recipient 
um, having some unconventional or unconditional biases of how he or she reacted subsequently after the incident has elapsed. So how do you factor the time elapsed into the equation when you are doing these kinds of studies? So in this study, of course, it was qualitative in nature, and we tried to have uh, we tried to give the questionnaire to the respondents before the interview has taken place. And considering the fact that yes, we did understand that probably they will forget some elements of the incident, but because of the weight of the incident, it was expected that they will be able to recall what happened, and we gave them the freedom to decide which incident they are comfortable sharing because of course the topic is itself very sensitive and makes people very uncomfortable to talk to we gave them the freedom and we gave them the freedom and yes we had respondents who said this incident happened 16 years ago and they still said that I remember it I had one respondent he was an ICU nurse and he basically mentioned how he really handled poorly one of the nurses when something happened and he remembered that after 16 years because he felt so guilty after even though he left he was retired but he said I still remember because I, he felt so guilt so heavy in his chest for that abusive behavior, he did remember the incident, but he didn't apologize three years, still three years. He said, I didn't apologize because it was his ego, but after three years, he apologized. And I also had respondents who apologized to the victim within six months. I see. But they, and I also had ad managers who never apologized, but they feel guilty, but they did not want to apologize. Some people, some managers were, they didn't have hold of the victim. The victim left the workplace, but guilt was common among every one of them. I agree. Okay, very good. Excellent. Um, I do have um, one question here from one of the participants here, so I want to prioritize that question first. Um, what industry were those participants from? Um, I apologize if you already shared this presentation. Yes, definitely. I can go back and I will show you right now. So I had respondents from food. I had four interviews from the food sector, five from hospitality and retail, five from construction, one from financial, two from education, two from entertainment, and two from medical. Very good. Very good. And, you know, this slide tells about the countries of uh, representation as well. Uh, yes. In terms of collectivist and individualistic country orientation. That's good. All right. Very good. Um, I'm looking for any questions over here. So I have um, three more questions, if you don't mind. <laughs> I'll continue. Okay. Um, so um, as part of your uh, research obligations, when someone is telling some information, um, what ethical obligations uh, did you have as a researcher to report certain things that were inappropriate? Yes. So during the survey, uh, the first part of the survey was, of course, uh, explaining them the benefit and the risk involved. The most important ethical component we kept in mind was offering them the counseling, mental health counseling number, because we did realize the fact that recalling such incident might make might make some employees feel might make some respondents feel uncomfortable. So yes, during the survey and before the interview took place, we gave them the contact information of free online mental health counseling in case if they felt the need to consult them afterwards. And of course, during, before the interview, may, we made it very clear that you don't have to answer any portion if you are not comfortable answering and you can stop the interview at any point in time if you are not comfortable without any penalty. Any penalty. Okay, that, that, that good. that's good. Excellent, excellent. Um, I, I want to ask a couple more questions with the future forward of your research perspective. Um, so now that you have done your research, um, for the recipients of this abusive behavior, as well as the people who are going to be first-time managers or middle managers that are emerging in, you know, global and multinational and, you know, all those cultures, if you were to come and say academic institutions um, have to do certain things as part of their leadership classes or our management classes, what kind of uh, specific trainings that we can include, modules that we can include to address these kind of abusive behaviors that they should not carry forward? I think one important training that all managers and even employees need to do is neutralization technique, uh, understanding this technique, because many times what happens, people get involved into questionable interaction and they're not aware of their uh, action. They often don't see it because they often 
have tunnel vision and many times employees, people cannot see what they do. Other person can see because everybody often have good impression. We, as we all know, we all have a very, we try to have good impression about ourselves. None of us like to feel or consider, want to consider ourselves to be a negative person. Now, the most important training is to make, develop a training where people can assess themselves. People can do different personality tests to understand who has what type level of justification tendencies. Because all of us, of, of course, all people do not have same level of tendency to justify, right? You probably might have met some people who always will justify their action. But then I'm sure you also have met people who are not prone to such justifications, right? But we don't know what type of employee or what type of managers might be more prone to such things. So I think offering training of that nature, letting employees do different assessments so that they can understand their own personality, their chances for getting involved into different rationalization and justification tendencies, I think will be very helpful. That That's wonderful. That's wonderful because in the last session, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Thompson was talking about the Johari window. Um, you know, what you know about yourself, what you don't know about yourself and what others know about you and don't know about, you know, that 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 good quadrant. And I think that's a very good uh, thought process to bring over here in terms of how this uh, neutralization technique could be understood as well as the assessment techniques that you are talking about could be um, used in the classes. So that's wonderful. Um, one last question. I'm still waiting for others to ask any question. One last question. Um, now, one of the things that as a researcher that we all feel is uh, the lack, you know, the stipulation of time, right? We need to finish certain things by certain time frame. So we put some scope boxing and say, this is what we can do in the next three years or two years or whatever be the case. If you had more time to continue with your research, or if you would like other people to continue with your research where you left off, what are some of the things that you would like others to you know, pick up from where you left off? I would really want to include a lot more demographic variables mm. because I think, of course, I try to have many different sectors represented, but of course, uh, my respondent was basically male and I didn't have a lot of female respondents. So I think I'm very excited to see what it would look if it was 50-50 of both genders. And of course, have more countries represented, maybe more countries from Europe. So I think that's something I would like to explore. But I think that will be interesting to explore how uh, different countries, more maybe from Europe, react. Or maybe more South Asian countries like Vietnam, Japan, because Japan and China has very different culture. So I would be excited to know, uh, explore how that would look. That, that's wonderful. Um, I remember publishing my own postdoctoral research called Tones Framework um, and, you know, how that could be used for middle management transformation. So, you know, perhaps uh, there's an opportunity to collaborate on that as well. So Definitely, I will be excited to do so. Awesome. That's wonderful. Um, again, um, I'm looking for any questions. Uh, if there are any questions, please use the chat window. We'll wait for about 30 seconds or so. Uh, but we are also coming up on time. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Tracy, this was an awesome presentation. Um, we really uh, appreciate the time that you have taken to document your research and share it with the rest of us. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'm glad to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tracy. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I believe we did answer all questions in the chat. Um, I don't know if we answered Jeffrey's questions, but um i believe there was a yeah i believe i answered the, uh, yeah she answered the question what action uh, would you recommend for those individuals with abusive managers okay uh, yes perfect, perfect. Um, um yep so, 